All right, so we've been doing a series called The Truth About, and this one here is called An Unshakable Foundations. Unshakable Foundations. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you needed my attention. All right. So God has been giving us bits of truth, and these bits of truth are always to be in our remembrance. One bit of truth is we are in Christ. Everyone say, I'm in, I'm in Christ. All right, the word in, don't forget, everywhere through the scripture, those words mean a lot. So if we're in Christ, where are we? Yeah. We're in Christ, aren't we? Well, people go, well, yeah, but see, your mind can't grasp it until God re puts it and permeates it in you. For example, if you're in your car, where are you? Right. And if you're not in your car, where are you? Not in your car. So when the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, it's not, it's not lying to you. It's not suggesting a few things. It says you're a new creation. Now, the problem is we're used to living with ourselves the way we used to live with ourselves. We need to learn to walk with Jesus so he can teach us how to live with our new self. Hallelujah! And that's the adventure that you and I have in Christ. Can you say amen? amen? A little bits of wisdom. For example, the Bible says that you are dead. Now let me ask you, what a statement. The Bible says you are dead. What part of you is it talking about? Your flesh. You are to reckon your flesh. That little thing that follows you around. <laughs> as dead and when you meet with God the first thing it says to lay it on the altar so you consider yourself dead so when you get out of your prayer however long it is you're walking in newness of life do not draw the old ways of thinking back into the newness of life let God give you ideas and encourage you meanwhile you just live your life to the fullness you all have routines and such. Are you with me? Here's another bit of wisdom. So you're hidden in Christ. You are in Christ, in God. Now you need to, we need to fathom that. So if we're in Christ, in God, how does the devil know who we are? Because we're living us instead of living in Christ. Now I'm not trying to put us down. I'm just trying to show you that many Christians today don't understand the difference between working hard and let, or letting God do the work and we follow along. The Bible says we follow our shepherd, right? We don't make decisions for him. Can you say amen? So what do we do? We, we, we want to go on a vacation. So... We decide, oh, that's going to be a good idea. And that's how you, first thing you did is you did not go to God and say, hey, what would be a good vacation for me? You know me better than I know myself. You know what I can afford. You know what I can't. And you consult with the one who knows everything and immediately goes to work showing you about your vacation and he puts favor all in it. In other words, if you're fishing, you're going to catch fish. <laughs> You might be the only one that does. I remember one time I was going on fishing, and we're up in a lake that hardly has any fish. It's way up there in Crystal Mountain, um, Lake Cochise or something. I can't remember exactly what the name is. And it's usually frozen three, three quarters of the year. So when it thaws, everybody goes out there to try to fish. Well, there's no fish, but it's a beautiful lake. I says, Dad, I don't want to just go out and drop a hook and wet a worm. I want to catch something. He says, well, let's take dominion over it. He was laughing at me. You're serious, son. You're taking dominion over the fish in this sea, in this lake, and you're going to ask him to bite your hook? I says, yeah. And you know who's the only one that caught the fish that day? One fish, one little fish. The one that God wanted to show that that kind of thing does work. <laughs> So he used me. You know, it's the ways to go. Here's another bit of wisdom. Bible, God's been telling us for three and a half years, more probably four now, eyes on me, eyes off the world, eyes off others, eyes off 
yourself. Now, Carrie, can you define that a little bit more for me? I'm glad you asked that question. Number one, eyes are off the world because the world is falling away. All the world is crumbling. Have you noticed that just about everything that people put their trust in is being shaken now? Stock market, investments, bankers, IRS, government officials, all these different governments are all being shaken up. Who do you think is doing that? God. And I'll show you here in a minute. So that we don't put our trust in man or in the world, but we put our trust back in God. Amen, right? And we put him first, everything else will line up. But if he isn't first, then we are building on sifting sand and we could be tossed to and fro by whatever pressures come our way. I don't know about you, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So we are eyes off the world, eyes off of others because other people can scam you. God forbid. Other people mean well, but maybe they don't have enough information, so they give you advice, but the advice doesn't work. Because we're looking for answers, all of us, aren't we? But we know who has the answer. He's a good, good father. Amen? And so we go to him for answers. We go to him for something that's always the truth, always good news. He's always going to encourage his children. Why? Have you ever heard your God say, hey, don't bother walking with me anymore because I'm done with you? You know, people, I don't know about you, but I've talked to hundreds of people who think that about God. God's never done with us. Till the last breath you breathe, he'll always be wanting to help. Can you say amen? That's your heavenly father. So an unshakable foundation under your feet. Let me give you a couple of quotes. The Bible warns us in the Old Testament the scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, you might want to write this down, but we're not, I'm just going to quote it for you. But it's in 1 Corinthians 10. That's a warning. Paul writes about how the Israelites got so filled with himself that they actually told God how to do things. Now, I'm not putting down Israelites. It's just human nature for us to be our own God, you know, until we discover there is a God. To be our own man. To be, you know, I did it my way. <laughs> the idea is for us to learn it God's way because we won't have so many failures. We won't have things that, that, that seem to don't go anywhere. Can you say amen? God wants us to have life and he wants us to have it what? More abundantly. So we got to sit down, yoke up with Jesus, learn from him the way in which to walk in the newness of life, to walk in the spirit of life. So the world is not going to teach us that way. Now, we also keep our eyes off ourselves, don't we? Why? You want to get depressed? Just focus on yourself for a while. <laughs> now, this is a joke. That would depress anybody. <laughs> All right, let's move right on. Okay, so... Let's get into this. Everybody, you with me? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Every person and life must be built on a solid foundation. You don't build a house without a solid foundation. Can you say amen? Think of these skyscrapers. They have to dig so far down so they can go so far up. They need a foundation. Can you say amen? What are you sitting on? You're sitting on a foundation, a chair. What are you standing on? You're standing on the earth. You're standing on a foundation. We know that if it's water, you're not going to go off the dock and stand on top of the water unless you're Jesus. Or unless Jesus told you to. And please don't take your bathing suit. You're already planning for failure. <laughs> I believe in God. Why do you have the snorkel and the bathing suit? Well, just in case, you know. Anyway, the whole idea is, are you still with me? You got Hebrews chapter 12? Okay. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Now listen, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you stay right there. The Bible says that the Israelites followed God. And it says that they passed through the sea and then got into 
the promised land. And then it says, and they followed the rock. And the rock that followed them was Christ. Everyone say Christ. Christ. All right. So that means that everywhere the Israels went, Jesus supported them. So when they took a step, the rock supported them. So it kept following them. Remember in the Old Testament, God is going after them and supporting them. But in the New Testament, God is walking with us and in us. The difference. So it says, and they followed God in the desert and the rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. Everyone say Christ. Do you remember the story of the rock? Moses hit the rock and out of it came water. Then he got in big trouble because he hit the rock twice. That's the reason why he couldn't go into the promised land because the rock is Christ, isn't it? How many times was Jesus stricken for you? Once. Man beat Jesus to death for our sin. Okay? Satan did that. He's the rock. Now, you need to understand the gospel. And so, that's all. Now, we don't beat the rock again. <laughs> Hello? We don't beat Jesus. No, we speak to the rock. See, back in the Old Testament, Moses struck the rock. And water came out anytime they want. And the rock followed them. So they always had plenty of fresh water, godly water to drink. But then the people got to grumbling and complaining and Moses began to be a politician and he listened to the negative people. And they said, Moses, we're, we're thirsty. And so he was just struck by his congregation and he struck the rock, the rock again out of anger. And Jesus, you can't strike Jesus. Satan, you can't strike Jesus because all hell will break loose on him. So he doesn't touch him. He can't touch Jesus. That's why you surround your life with them. Hello? So it says the rock that followed him, that rock was Christ. And the purpose is you need to understand that the rock is the foundation of our feet. Can you say his name is Jesus? But in the Old Testament, he wasn't in them. He followed them and supported them from the outside. In the New Testament, the rock is in us. We're on the rock. Can you say amen? I am on the rock. Right? I'm on the rock. And so the idea is for us to understand. So Hebrews, please. Verse 22 of chapter 12. But you have come to Mount Zion. Now, again, people like me to explain certain things. So the Bible comes alive. Every time you see a mountain, it means a kingdom of authority. You read in the book of Daniel, it talks about the mountain kingdoms. Those are just kingdoms like Babylon and like Rome and like uh, uh, Greece. These are all mountain kingdoms. And those mountain kingdoms are where authority is. So everyone say in this case, it's the kingdom or authority. Okay, so you have not come to mount that shakes and has lightning, if you read passages before, because he's talking about the Old Testament. I'm talking to you with a drink in my hand. Anyway, so in the Old Testament, they couldn't approach God without a priest. So when Moses went up into the mountain, it was quaking. There were lightnings. If you even got close to it, you were thrust through with a dart. I mean, it was a terrible thing. But you and I in the New Testament have come into the kingdom that God made. So let me read it to you. So when you see Mount Zion, realize that it's a kingdom and acceptance of God's authority and you as a child of God. Just put that in there. Okay, and it says, but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God. Do you see? Okay. All right, the city of living. God, you're, you're sitting right up there with Jesus in the throne room. Glory to God. Right there in the throne room. Now listen. The, the heaven. The, the, again, again my, my eyes are tearing up. Said, and the city and the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem to the innumerable company of angels. I want to stop right there. And God wants us to know 
How many know that Lucifer fell? He was in this planet. He was the God of this world. He fell. And with him, it says one third of all the angels. You'll find that in Revelation 12. But I went to the Lord about it. I says, Lord, not all the angels that you ever created, not one third of them. No, he says, only the ones that were in the planet. So two thirds, yeah, you're, I thought you would enjoy that. Two thirds of the ones that were in the planet helping to get this planet ready for man didn't fall with Lucifer. But he got one third of the suckers to believe him and declared war to God. That's been the problem. That's called the seed of a woman and the seed of the serpent. That's the war that's going on, okay, for people's souls. I don't want to get into too much of it. There's a whole sermon or two later on. But <clears throat> you're in a numerous company of angels, folks. We have a tendency because Satan is so loud about what he does. It seems like the devil is winning or he's, he, he seems like we pay more attention to what he's doing. But God wants us to remember that you're in the company of so many angels. And if you knew how many were there, you wouldn't have a negative worry or concerned. There's all these huge angels waiting for the command of you to speak and believe the word and for God to tell them what to do. Meanwhile, all these little nymphs are running around saying, and the people who are into themselves, they're the only ones that hear that. And if you watch their life, it says they'll act crazy because of listening to what's been talking in their voice. In their heads. Now take a look at society. Aren't we seeing some pretty crazy things? Who do you think they might be listening to? <laughs> and I sound, listen, I'm a businessman. Ministry is my first and foremost in walking with Jesus. But there's always business involved in everything you do, right? You can't be poor businessman and run, run a ministry. Right? Listen. I do not want somebody who's never held down a job, who doesn't know how to work nor organize or plan, running my business. That is a signature for disaster. And right now the world has signed Satan up, and he seems to be running those dummies' business. Don't you listen to him. He has but a short time, and it's even shorter now. He's speaking loud. He's making noise. He's rattling all this stuff. But God is saying, I know my people come unto me. You see the difference? Come unto me and let me show you the future. And see, the problem is there's so much distraction and everything is going on. So let's go from here. The foundation that cannot be shaken. All right? Remember, God lives in you. Right? Let him take the lead. We follow Jesus. Can you say amen? While we walk with Jesus. While Jesus is the rock that supports our very steps. God comes up under us. And the more we walk with him, the more he comes up under us and lifts us up. You see, you can't fall down when you're on the firm foundation. If you're sitting on a firm foundation, you can't fall down. That's right. So don't get up in yourself. Let God lift you up. Amen. Amen. And do what he tells you to do because it always will work, even if you can't quite do it right. Look at Gideon. Mighty man of valor. He's hiding under a rock. Say, God has faith in me to support me as I walk with him. All right, let's finish Hebrews here. Now listen. So you've come to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly. That's all the people who's gone on before us. To the church of the firstborn. First Jesus and all the rest after him. Who are registered where? In heaven. And to the God, the judge. Of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, because we have Christ, to Jesus, the mediator or umpire of a new and better covenant with blood that's sprinkled that speaks better things than that of Abel. Let me just tell you this. 
Who killed Abel? There's you see the seed war. Satan tells you, you can do your own thing. It's great. God will be pleased. Cain did a wonderful, I'm sure his vegetables and everything were great, but God requires blood, not works. And the blood, remember, it's a shield. The reason why he covered them in blood, because now they had Satan's nature in their flesh. So God couldn't just walk right up to them unless they were covered so that putridness off our flesh wouldn't soil the holiness of God and God's presence wouldn't kill the flesh. How many know a lot of people died because they handled the presence of God in the Old Testament wrong? The ark, walking into the temple, you know, you got to walk in with, you got to walk by faith. So the problem is works. So Christians, going back to that one thing I said, and that is, many Christians today are working hard to be good Christians. What's wrong with that? The Satan has deceived him, just switched him a little bit. So now they're working hard and they're praying hard. And if they don't do this, they then we'll just tell them to stop that. That is not God. God is not nervous. Can you say amen? Nor is it unorganized. All that comes from nervous energy. Something's happened. And now I've got to do what I normally do. No, you need, you need to seek God and say, God, what do you want me to do about that? God, that's my child. God, that's my cousin. God, that's my president. What do you want me to do about that situation? Instead of acting the way we normally do. One time there was a kid. Actually, it was an adult, but he was younger than I. I call him a kid. One of my closest friends' son. That he was in the hospital. And the special people, the CDC and all that, were studying because he had something wrong with him. They couldn't tell what it was. So I got called. And so here's the key. Not because I'm anything special, just because my pastor trained me. He says, when you're on a call, before you even head out, pray and get the wisdom of God. So I prayed. I said, and God said, it's going to be just fine. You obey me. So I'm driving along, praying in the spirit, going through the highway. I'm going up to Tacoma General, if you know where that's at. And if you are watching by tape, you might remember, we might not. But anyway, I'm driving, and I'm saying, Lord, the parking here is just awful. And, and God says, go down to the lower street, and there's a parking spot. Now, you're thinking I'm, I'm, I'm hearing Whoa, the voice of, no, I just get an impression. So there it was, parking. I go right up the elevator, open the elevator, right across is his room. Talk about God. I don't even know that hospital very much. You know, you can wander around those things. Read the signs. Anyway, so I walked in the room, and the room's filled. What did Paul and Jesus do when they got a lot of unbelief in the room? Put them outside. Put them out because they are, they are negative parts that will suck the power of God away. So you don't have a room full of doubters praying and laying hands on people. <laughs> so I walked into the room, and, of course, my friend said to me, he says, they don't know. CDC was just here, and we don't know. And then God said in my, an impression in my spirit, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. So I, 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 he says, you have to be careful how you present that. You can't say, are you doing something that's causing this? <laughs> And so I, I looked at him, I said, I'm here to pray for you, and God's going to heal you. You know, and then his wife's sitting there, and she's so full of mad at God and everything like that. And these are Christians. See, good teaching, understanding the will of God will keep you safe. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 1, the very last scripture, read it. And, it's, and so I went in there, and I said to him, I says, is there anybody that you can think of that you've been mad at and you really haven't released in your heart. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. I don't want to know. But if there is, this is the problem. And he looked at his wife, and his wife's eye got big like that, and she looked at him, and he says, yes. And I said, well, let's just take a minute and ask God to forgive us. He did. He was out the next day. 
Now, did I really do anything? No, I just followed the leading of the Spirit. Why? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in me than he that's in the world, right? All right, so we have come to the spirits of just men made perfect, verse 24, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Verse 25 says, see that you do not refuse him. Now, there's the problem. God is speaking all the time to us. Are you listening? One of the things you need to be asking people, even your own children, is what's God been telling you lately? How's God been leading you lately? And if they go, you know, and they don't have a relationship, you need to begin to say, hey, you need, these are times you don't need to be in that condition. Do you want to be swept out? Seems to me like you bought a ticket to the Titanic. <laughs> Hello, didn't anybody advise you? All right, so you make sure you share with love because these are really tight times because the deception is, oh, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to do this and stuff. I got a handle on the gospel. Now your gospel moved from your spirit up back into your understanding where there's no substance at all. Let me just show you. This is, I love this illustration. Everybody receive. I'm going to pray for you. You ready? Now I'm thinking, bless God, Lord bless him and everything like that. Did you sense anything? Of course not. You who silently pray, open your mouth and speak the sword of the Spirit. See how deceptive the devil is? Oh, yeah, I have a prayer request. Well, God knows our heart. He knows our head. But he needs us to speak. Or he wouldn't have said, you believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. Believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. Believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. For with the mouth, we speak unrighteousness. And with our heart, we believe unto God. It didn't say think with your head. <laughs> God's trying to get us to quit that so much. Not throw your brain away, but just clean it out. How many know what happens if you don't dump your garbage and you're gone on a vacation for a week? That's what happens if you don't continue to pray with God, clean all that negative stuff that we've stored in there for such a long time. Moving right along. See that you do not refuse him who speaks from heaven. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth. Much more, we will not escape if we turn away from him, God, who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, listen, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but I will shake the heavens. So we're in the time where God is shaking everything up so man won't trust man. Satan has to come in with an antichrist saying, I'm the Messiah. We know it's a false one, false peace when they say peace and safety. He's shaking up everything, every department, everything that you can imagine is being shaken up. And you'll shake your family up too if your family isn't serving God. Why? Because this is a time of sifting. God is sifting the sheep from the goats. He's sifting the wheat from the tares. He's doing all that by the condition of our hearts. Are we virgins toward God? Do we love God? Are we just sitting there doing our whole thing and saying, oh, yeah, I love you, Jesus. Hello. Now, I know I'm, I'm hamming it up a little bit. But don't be thinking about it. You just want to make sure that your walk with the Lord is where you need to be. That's all it is. And so what happens? The enemy says, well, now you need to be concerned about this and need to be concerned about that. No, you just go to God and take your concerns to him, and he is powerful enough to actually do the things that we can't do ourselves. Say amen. Like change this nation, change this state, change the situations that need to change. Amen? Remember the unjust judge? Who did we teach you that the unjust judge was? Life. When life is handing you a brick, throw the brick back at the devil and pick up Jesus. Can you say amen? 
Don't accept things as being from God that don't describe God's nature and character. He is everything perfect. He's everything pure, everything good, anything else. There's some kind of corruption in it. That's why Jesus said that you're yay be yay and you're nay be nay. Because if you speak too many words, you're going to have some corruption in there. Misunderstanding. So speak the truth in love straight. Hey, you know, speak it in love straight. But the whole society, how about how many ever heard the, your kids say, don't lecture me? You're trying to give them advice about how to do something really good, and you hear this you're lecturing me. That's just what the enemy wants to put in their head. I mean, anybody would have sat under Jesus' feet and with that attitude, they wouldn't have got a thing out of it. So how do we break that down? By we stand and follow God. So God is working on all your family. So you don't need to be concerned about worrying about them. You just pray and lift them up every day. Lord, I thank you that you're working on my family. So let me get on past this because i got a few things that you can do and practice we want to get to. All right, so we found out, listen to this latter part. He's shaking everything that can shake. And then he says, whose voice then shook the earth, now it's shaking the heavens only too. Now this, once more, indicates the removal, the removal of things that are being shaken. Hello. Now, do you understand how they... they um, harvested wheat back in the day at Jesus' time. They had what they call a winnowing fork, a big pitchfork. It had about 15 rows of teeth. And they would scoop up the hay or the wheat and they would toss it up in the air. Now they're in a little kind of a brick deal, a threshing floor it's called. And they would take the wheat and toss it up in the air and the kernels would fall right back down to the threshing floor and the chaff, which is all the little crustaceans around the seeds, will blow through the wind. And that's what God is doing right now. He's tossing you and saying, what choices are you going to make? And the real you and the real Jesus, he's not going to throw you away. You're not going to go to, go to hell. But the real core of you that really is in love with Jesus will drop back down. And the part of you that you would say, I wish I didn't have, will float away. And that's what God is doing with us right now. He's separating the real you, the God type, new creature you, from your old you. Can you say amen? amen? Now let me ask you, which you are you following? It's a trick question. Which you are you following? None. I'm following him. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, we're supposed to be in the word. We're supposed to be feeding our spirit. Say amen. amen. And we're not supposed to be feeding our flesh so much. And I'm not talking about people, you know, I'm not talking about you. What do you mean? Well, if we just do what we want to do all the time and we don't read our Bible and we don't get into the things of God, then we're going to crust over with the old man and the devil will sell some more lies and we'll become worse than we were when we first got saved. Amen. So we have to be careful what we entertain, what we sow, because as we sow, what? We reap. So he that soweth to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. This is Galatians 6, uh, 7 and 8. And he that soweth to your human spirit, sow the word in there, a little bit of praise, a little worship, like you're doing, and you of the spirit reap everlasting life. So we have a choice every day to meet with God, so good things. Meet with God, so good things. And so it is written. It says, do good and walk with the Lord. It says, walk with the Lord and just do good. Walk with the Lord and do good. Well, I can't do that without the Lord. I can't be good without him. Can you? If you think you can... You are deceived. You can be good for a time. But then some will break down. You remember, folks, we forget. We get, to, we get to serving God, and then we thought we arrived. 
and we sort of glide for a while. <laughs> Don't do that. What happens to an airplane when the engines are cut off? It will glide for a while, but it's going to come down. So we operate the principles God gives us, that, and we do it with joy. We just do it. It's like brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth, your teeth are going to rot. You just do it. Go take a shower. You just do it. You meet with God. You just do it. And guess what? Let me show you the results. All right, let's go on. Therefore, since we have a receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Say, I'm receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. How many here have God in you? Can Satan fight against God in you? Can, I, know you I know what you meant. It's okay. He can't. But can the devil defeat you? Yeah, so that's why we bring God out to our forefront. Instead of saying, yeah, I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do that. No, God helps me to do this. God helps me to do And God always stays sort of in the forefront. Why? Because Satan can't accuse God. And you have God. But are we operating in our old man or are we operating in our good man? So listen, if you ever catch yourself fleshing it out, getting kind of carnal about things, don't stay there long. It's a lonely place. Let's move right on. So again, we know that Mount Zion is authority. We've come that God is building in us and building a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Why? He's removing the things that are being shaken. The world is passing away. People either need to make a choice for God or they're going to go somewhere else they don't want to go. And it isn't God sending them there. It's them refusing God's help. That's all it is. Let's move on. Go with me to Luke, Luke chapter 6. The wise Christian. The wise Christian. That's you. Amen. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now remember, nobody's born again yet. Who's the rock that followed Jesus? Don't lose me here. Jesus is teaching his disciples, right? Who's the rock that's supporting these disciples? Jesus. So they're with Jesus, and Jesus is with them. Now, is Jesus in them? No. You know, he didn't die, didn't rise again. Come on, folks. You should know this like the back of your hand. No, he's with his disciples. And he says some pretty strange things, like what he's going to say. He says, like, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you can't even do what I tell you? How many know that if, you, if the boss asks you to do something and you do it and he likes the way you do it, you got favor with the boss. Now that's the world. If God asks you to do something and you do it, even if you don't quite do it right, but you do it, you're his child and it pleases God to no end. So when you obey, listen, when you obey God, what he tells you to do, and you obey him, it really will be God in you doing the work. So the steps that you take, guess who's under your feet? Not Satan. You're stepping on Jesus' foundation. Can you say amen? So when you're following Jesus, everywhere you go, didn't he say to Joshua, every step you take, you declare it as a part of God. So we forget some of these basic things. So, say, everywhere I stand, I stand on Christ. Everywhere I walk, I walk with Christ. When I walk and I stand in Christ, Satan immediately loses. So let's find out a little bit more about this unshakable kingdom that you have. So Luke 6 says... But why do you call me? Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples. They're not born again. Listen, so I have to bring this up. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Now, he says, whoever comes to me, whoever does what? Luke 6, 46, uh, 46 through 48, 49, sorry. He says, what do they have to do first? 
He, no, listen, but you miss everything that Jesus said and the way it's written down is concisely a formula, not a practice, but a formula of understanding how the spiritual kingdom works. So listen to what Jesus says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Don't just mouth my stuff. You got to act on it. Say amen. amen. Don't call me Lord if you can't follow what I'm asking you. Because what I ask you to do is just like me do it. No satanic spirit can stop it. When I said, Moses, put that stick in the water, do you think any devil in hell could keep the water from parting? Why do we think Satan can hinder us so much? Listen. I know I'm being rather, rather matter of fact, but I've got to get through this. I sure love you lots. Okay, now catch this. All right, he says, he who comes to me. First thing you have to do if you're going to hear from God is you have to humbly approach him. He doesn't approach you. He already did that. Now you have to approach him every day, purposely. And he's telling his disciples, you got to come to me, guys, so I can put the rock under your feet, show you how to get that firm foundation that can't be shaken. Now pay attention. Remember Jesus kept on walking around saying, hey, them with ears, let them hear. What was he saying? He's saying a lot of people hear something, but they don't listen. I'm going to tell you something my pastor told me a long ago, and it really helped me. And that is, only those who pay attention grow. And it's really hard because sometimes we're challenged. And just remember, you don't have to do it. God in you does the work. Just follow him. Well, that sounds pretty easy. That's kind of like Scott and I want to go fishing. So we hire a guide. Now we expect that guide to take us place where that fish is because we paid big bucks. All right? It'd be kind of foolish to get in a boat and the guy says, well, I don't know where to take you. Right? Think about it. Didn't Jesus tell his disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side? And he stayed there and prayed. Right? And then... They start freaking out because of the storm. This was a demonic storm. This is when a God storm. This is a demonic storm. They happen. And here comes Jesus rescued them across the water. That's a symbol of Jesus being with the Old Testament believers. See, he had to follow and be with them. And then we know that in one other time, Jesus was in the boat, wasn't he? Folks, Jesus is in your boat. So don't run by the older man that's influenced by the weather and things. But run by the God who lives in your heart who says, peace, be still. Let him out. Let him out. So some of you are learning how to do this. And so I talk like, hey, it's just normal. No, it took years. But, but you're getting stuff. You don't have to filter through all the other junk. Did you know there's a lot of junk out there? How many has ever been to a library? And in order to find a real good book, you've got to search for a little while, don't you? Now, when libraries are removed, you just go on the web. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. All this relates, okay? Then he says, must come to me, learn and hear my sayings. He didn't say what I said. He said, say yings. Jesus repeated himself all the time. Peter, do you really love me? Okay. Here's my sayings and what? Here's my saying and does them. So, folks, you can only do what you know and understand what God wants you to do. So just do it. If you're young, it's going to be simple things. God just loves it. As you learn more of the scripture and you just try to practice as best you can, remember the Holy Spirit's helping you. You'll grow, and the foundation underneath your feet will grow also. Can you say amen? And that foundation is God. So listen. He says, he comes to me, hears my saying, and does them. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a wise man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. 
Who's the rock? Amen. You build your life on Jesus. You build your life on the principles of the word. You're doing things, make sure what you're experiencing and what you're living, line it up with the word. And if you don't know, you got a pastor that can help. Pastors, actually, my wife's just as good as I am. And so you come and decide, I need a little more help in this area. What am I doing wrong? And it might not be what you're doing wrong. Maybe you just need a little praise a little more. But really, it's the practice of the word that builds the unshakable foundation. Say, practicing the word. If the word says, love your neighbor, and yet your neighbor you hate, what do you do there? You love them with the God love in you, not with your own ability. See, here we go, trying to fix it on our own strength. Listen, I don't know about you. Have you ever been decked or slapped? It hurts. And to turn the other cheek, it has to be God's love. <laughs> Amen. Ah, move right on. Okay, so listen. He, I will liken unto a wise man that dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the, now listen, this, it rains on the just and the unjust. The winds blow and the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house. Listen to the next phrase. And could not shake it. It didn't say shakes a little bit, wobbles some. See, that's the lie. That's the bag of rocks. No, it says if you hear and you do, what you hear and do cannot be challenged because what you hear and do is God. And God has never lost a battle. He's never been wrong. He's been perfect in everything. So naturally, he's telling his disciples, listen, you've got to hear what I'm telling you. You got to pay attention to what I'm saying, and now you've got to do your best to, to practice these things. Now you're going to fail, but I'll be right there with you to help you. And then what happens is this huge foundation comes up underneath you. And even it says, even if you fall, God's up under you. It says, though a righteous man may fall, yea, or seven times, the Lord will raise him up. So God knows we're, we, we, have, we're, we need help. So why do we focus so much on, oh, gee, I'm not going to trust that man. He fell. Just go ahead and keep on doing that. We'll see you as you fell. But it's how we get up and follow God. Can you say amen? All right. Now, I love this. But he who hears my saying and does not do it is like he who builds his house on the sand. There you got the two lives. You got the old life, the sand, and you got the new life, the rock. Could you say amen? So if we start just living our life without God being involved, we're subject to a shifting sand and there's nothing under our feet that can steady us. That's why Christians are up and down and in and out. They don't have any prayer life. It's a, it's a case of suffering from a lack of prayer. And so that's why they're irritated and frustrated. They're up, they're out, because they don't pray. They don't know how to give things to God. And so we want to help everybody that way. Can we say amen? Us older saints are supposed to be teaching the younger ones. I love this. Now, it's sifting sand, and it says the winds come and the floods blows and beat upon both houses. But great was the fall of that one. Your life is so precious. Every human life is so precious. Yet we lose, we lose over 5,000 a day through abortion. I, I renounce that. I hate that. God hates that. I don't want anything to do with that. To take innocent life is a curse, surely. But anyway, I don't want to get caught up in that plane because we have to go to God for him to straighten that out because it's huge and it's way bigger than a lot of us can do. We simply obey God and pray. Could you say amen? But if we focus too long on that, it'll make us negative. What's the Bible say? It says men's hearts in the last day will fail them for fear. 
Because they're looking after the things that are coming on the earth. It's in Luke. So don't look at what's coming. Look at who's coming. Amen. Amen. Walk with the one who's your shepherd. Jesus says, I didn't leave you orphan. Jesus is right here in your heart, right here in the earth. But you can't see him. The Holy Spirit says, but you come to me. You got a foundation that cannot be shaken. While the whole world is passing away, you cannot be shaken. Now, your old man can, but thank God you don't live in your old man anymore. You lay him in the altar. Amen. There's a special little hook there in your prayer closet. It says, lay your flesh down right here. <laughs> Amen. All right, so let's go on. It will help us to know that our foundation is based on learning and doing the word. This builds Christ under our feet so we can't exalt ourselves. That is why the enemy tries to keep us from understanding the word and from then acting on what we understand because he can't fight against the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was? If the word was God, can he fight against God? No, that's why you live with the word. When Satan came to Jesus and tempted him, what did Jesus say? The word. When the enemy comes to you, answer the word. You, you, if anything else, God loves me and I'm God's property, take your hands off of me. Once, once you declare who you are, he has to honor that because God will slap the tar right out of him. So we don't realize that once we rebuke and we appeal to God, the big ones from God step right in and say, you heard him, out. But we're not taught that often enough, so we don't realize that that happens. The big old bodyguards that you have go wide over. I've been in deliverance sessions where people actually have demons cast out of them. And I watch huge angels come and just yank that spirit right out of them. I came into this room and I said, and this little girl was laying on the floor. She was no bigger than 5'2". And she... Two of my elders were, the Randall brothers, were on, on her arms, one on right hand, one on the left hand. And she rolls her head up like that, and her eyes roll back like this. And out of the scrabbly voice, because it, it's not their voice, the Spirit's trying to use their voice, says, you can't cast me out. And I just started laughing. I just, <laughs> that irritates irritate the devil, just a laugh at what he says. Just irritates the snot out of him. Excuse my expression. And I just started laughing. The Holy Spirit's got me laughing. I says, that's right. I can't do a thing. But in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, God can. And I just released God. And man, that lady, Wah! and she flipped this big guy over onto the wall. Boom. And then she flipped this other guy onto the wall while the Spirit's coming out of her. Now, I do not recommend that for church. <laughs> Although, we've seen some deliverances here, but we used to have what we call a meeting called Saturday Night Live. And we, all kinds of things would happen. And God did great things. Did you ever get a chance to, to come to Saturday Night Live? That's before I even knew there was a Saturday Night Live on TV. Anyway, so, second thing I want to tell you is notice that we must come to him and listen. Come to him and listen. So when you come to God in the morning, shut up. Just go in there and say, God, I want to listen. Do you have anything to tell me first? You know, I'm, I don't really mean shut up, but you know, you have to be quiet. And then you tell God how much you love him and you just start loving on him. Now, God's not going to look at you like sometimes we've looked at our kids and say, what do you want? <laughs> All right? So catch this. Do not be a professional student. That's people that comes to church all the time and they got all this learning to go, but they never do anything with it. They are professors of the gospel, but they're not disciples of Jesus. There's a difference. Now, I'm not putting anybody down. You've got to know the difference. Are you a disciple of Jesus or do you just proclaim 
the Lord. We're all disciples of the Lord. He's teaching us how to walk with him. James chapter 1, we'll be done with you, okay? James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. So when you hear God and you do what God wants, it becomes a foundation. So you meet with God, you hear what God wants, and you follow it. Now, here's the problem. A lot of Christians haven't yet heard God's voice. And yet... Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. So somebody's interfering. So let's help you hear God's voice if you don't know how to hear it. I have a little class on it. It's fun. You ask God questions, he answers you. And you go, whoa. Try something on your birthday. Ask God what he think thought about you when you were born. Never thought about doing that, did you? I never thought about it either. I, the other day on my birthday, I says, Lord, on my birthday. He says, on your birthday. He, he just spoke it. He says, on your birthday, you brought me great joy. Now, we look at that as, well, how come he said that to him and not to me? If you ask him, he'll say the same thing to you. It brings God joy for you to be alive. You're his child. But to hear him say that, wow. God's, have you ever heard God laugh? Well, he actually kind of chuckles. You, you say, Lord, look at what's, what these people are doing. He goes, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can almost hear him in the spirit realm. Now, I'm not trying to be weird with you. I'm just trying to say the closer you get with God, the more in friendship you come. Okay, and don't compare people's walks with other people's walks. I'm in a different place than you are. You're in a different place than I am. We're all going to experience more or less what everybody else experienced. Eyes off a of man. That's why we don't compare and look to man. God has got you right where he wants you because you meet with him and you love him. Don't be looking over there and say, how come I don't, don't have what they have? Now, I want to tell you, the reason why I look over at you, because you're the most innocent person in the room. So it has nothing to do with it. Just that's what that is. I always try to keep my eyes roaming around. And sometimes, you know, it's just that way. All right, so let's go on. We got to hear the word. We got to do the word. But we first have to come to God, right? All right, show me a doer of the word. And I'll show you a person blessed in what they do. So James chapter 1 verse 21. Therefore lay aside. This is your older man now. Remember he's talking. Book of James is talking to a lot of Jewish people. He says you guys had the oracles of God. You had the Ten Commandments. You had all of this. That's why he's rather harsh in the book of Hebrews. About having tasted God. This and this. To fall away. To be brought back to repentance. Because they had a double whammy. They were Jewish. Now where they were born again Jewish. See that's why that scripture is not relating to you. Because you're going to fall down a lot. God is never going to leave you nor forsake you. But the Jewish people had the ordinance of God. They had the strict warnings. And then they left a lot of that and went into the gospel. And God warns them. He says, now there is no falling away for you. Because you don't have an excuse. So be glad you're not Jewish. Because they got a double whammy of respect to God that they need to follow. Now, I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm just trying to teach you. All right, so let's look at this. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of naughtiness or wickedness, dirty jokes and such, and receive with meekness. Everyone, does anybody here not know what meekness is? It's not weakness. Meekness is like you got a giant horse, and yet you can get on it. It's so gentle. Meekness is when you got the power, you only use what's necessary. It's like you bought new grommets in your sink, right? But the person that's using your bathroom has bad grommets in theirs. So they're always slamming the, the thing shut like that, like it needs to be wrenched shut. And you got new grommets. Meekness is the ability to look at a situation and know what's needed. Hello? Say, I just got it. All right. <clears throat> 
catch this. But he says, receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word. What are we supposed to do with the word? Receive it. He that comes to me and hears my saying and does them, we're to receive the implanted or engrafted word which is able to do what to our souls? What to our souls? Save. That's the part you wrestle with, your head. So you get in the word, it straightens out your thinking. Can you say amen? From time to time, we all need a little bit of that. So watch what it says further. I love this. And it says, it says, receive with meekness and grafted word truths, able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now listen. Deceiving yourself. Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only because you will deceive yourself. 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, but not a doer of it, he is like a man dis observing who? Himself. Now, what did we say? Eyes off the world, eyes off of others, and eyes off of our self. A natural man is just our old natural man. It's not the spiritual part of you. It's the, just the natural man. It's a machine. So the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we'll mess things up. That's why you bypass the natural man. So listen to what it says. He beholds himself. And so when a person knows what the word says... But when they focus on themselves, immediately they get discouraged. How am I going to do that? You're not. You're going to pray and ask God to help you to do that. Maybe you're the best worker that they got and you're sharp with it. Why don't you ask God to increase your sharpness? dazzle somebody with God <laughs> why not hello I'll tell you something about Joe we had this beautiful tr uh, swing toy that we got from a public school and we paid pennies for it multi thousand dollar forty thousand dollar swing set and everything we could only use part of it and so Joe volunteers I'm going to put it together but there's no plans or nothing he followed the leading of the Spirit, and God ordered his steps, and he put it together. Go down there and look at it. Now, God did that through Joe. Amen. He'll do all kinds of things through you. Just call on him to help you. Listen, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. You'll deceive yourself. For if anyone was a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself. <laughs> bummer and goes away and immediately forgets what a kind of man he was why because your mind goes you gotta follow your heart and then I love this but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty where's that perfect law of liberty at folks it's your bible that's the law of liberty, the New Testament. Not the Old Testament, the New Testament. I don't throw the Old Testament away. But if you try to practice the Old Testament, you'll fall from grace. Because they didn't have a resurrected Christ. In the New Testament, the truths in the New Testament relate to a person that's born again. That's the difference. Oh, yes, yeah, study the Old Testament. But when you do, don't try to practice their rituals. Because those were reminders for the Jewish nation that there is a Messiah, which, by the way, when he showed up, they would immediately want to kill him. Jeez. How would you like to go to the church like that? Hi, I'm your pastor. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Don't you see the humor in that? There's somebody who understands humor right there. You're my friend, brother. All right, so let's quickly get through this, okay, you guys? Then he goes on, but he where looks at the perfect law of liberty and, listen, continues in it, 
continues in it. There's the key. I'm oh, sure you got a good jolt or some good time, but you got to continue in it. And God's the one that does that with us. Amen. All right? Remember, you went to that revival meeting, you got all fired up, and about three weeks later, what happened? You didn't continue in it. All right, so uh, don't throw anything at me. So he goes and continues it, and it is not a forgetful here. People ask me all the time, how do you remember so much scripture? You're not a forgetful here if you're constantly reading it and constantly talking it. It just becomes natural. You're not trying to memorize anything. I don't even know how I, I do any of that, bringing out a scripture when I need it. Just because you are depositing the word in there, maybe it's not registering here so much, but it's in there. And then when you need it, God says, I'll bring it out for you. So don't be worried about memorization. There you are trying to do the work. God, I'll bring the donkey. <laughs> God says, leave me at home. Amen. Let's walk. All right, so let's go. Just a couple more minutes, all right, and we're done. Remember, there are two of you, okay? So you need to feed the real you, and you need to starve the other. Feed your faith, starve your doubts. All doubt comes from your flesh. Did you know in your spirit who lives in here? God. Can God sin? Can God lie? Can God cheat? Can God be unfair in any way? That's why Paul says walk from your inside out. Walk from your spirit out. Because then you won't be acting like a boob. You know? Follow your heart. Why? He'll give you the time of your life. Amen. All right. So some other time I'll talk about the visions and the things God took me through the years. Just little things. And I was still so young in the Lord. I didn't even know what it was until I read it in the book of Acts. But God is an adventure for you. Stop thinking you got to work hard for it. You got to believe for it and just obey. Moving right along. I hope that gives you some hope, okay? Now, okay, finishing up. Proverbs chapter 2. Let's go there. Verse 6 through 8. Boy, I did go over, didn't I? Oh, sorry about that, guys. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, and it comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. That's you. He shields those who walk uprightly. That's you. He's shielding you. He guards the path of the just and preserves the way of his saints. Let me give you some quick things. Number one, if you're going to walk with the Lord on a firm foundation, accept everything God wants to give you. Don't analyze it. Just accept it like a child. Two, study the word. Don't just read it. You say, well, how do I go about doing it? Hey, come to me. I'll show you how to study. There's a lot of ways you can study the word. And it's not the volume or having all the understanding. It's just going after the treasures that you need for your walk to glorify God. Say amen. Thirdly, practice as much of what you understand of the word as you can. This is the very foundation for your feet. All right? And then fourthly, throughout the day, learn to talk to God. Like, for example, yesterday we had a wonderful celebration. I got up in the morning and God and I were talking. Oh, Lord, I've got to figure out how to drain the tank. Anyway, I'm, I'm just talking away. Now, the Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to the way of your own thinking, your own understanding. In all your ways, what? The word acknowledge means to be aware of God and to engage him. To acknowledge somebody is to say, oh, hi, Linda. How are you doing? <laughs> Hello? But what we do is we pray and then we forget about the whole rest of the day. How, God, how are you feeling about this? You know, please help me. If I'm clumsy in anything that I'm doing, God, please help. And I just talk along with God. And then God and you are walking around, 
Can we do that, Pastor? Yes, you're supposed to be doing that. In all your ways, engage God and acknowledge God. Then he directs your path. If you're not acknowledging there's a God other than the prayer time that you had with him during the day, then how can he direct your path? I mean, I'll go to the store and God says, go to this store. I'll go to that store and everything I need is on sale. He will direct your path. Lord, I don't know where to apply. Seek him, engage him, love him, and he will direct your paths. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's you. If you got something out of that today, would you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen.